Welcome to Your Strata Property, the podcast for property owners looking for reliable, accurate and bite-sized information from an experienced and authoritative source. To access previous episodes and useful strata tips, go to www.yourstrataproperty.com.au. Hello and welcome to this week's podcast episode. I am your host, Amanda Farmer, helping you make sense of this often complex, confusing world of apartment living. This week, I'm bringing you the audio recording from my live video interview with Joe Cooper and Sharon Levy. Now, Joe is the lot owner who recently won a court battle here in New South Wales, allowing her to keep her pet dog, Angus, even though her building has a bylaw banning pets. Sharon Levy is her lawyer who led her case to success before the New South Wales Court of Appeal. This interview happened over on Facebook last Friday, the 16th of October. We streamed it to LinkedIn as well. The judgment itself was handed down earlier last week on the Monday. What you're about to hear is an edited version of that video interview. You can watch the full version over on Facebook. If you do that, you can see Joe, Sharon, myself, as well as meet Angus. You'll hear him make a cameo here in the recording. Just head over to Facebook, type your strata property into the search bar and you will see the video there on our Facebook page. Well over 2,000 of you have already watched that video and as you'll hear in the audio here now, we had many, many people tuning in live last Friday, commenting and asking questions, which we have done our best to answer as we go along. Now, the link to our Facebook page, as well as all of the links that we mention in this chat, including the link to go and read a copy of the judgment, are in the show notes for this episode. You'll find them over where all of our podcast episodes are on yourstrataproperty.com.au forward slash podcasts. And you can also get a copy of the transcript there as well. Now, this is a longer episode than our usual, but this is such an important development in New South Wales strata law. I haven't wanted you to miss out on any of the discussion. The first half of my chat is with Jo Cooper as she shares with us exactly why she decided to turn her life upside down these past few years, including what the future holds for her now. The second half of my chat is with Sharon Levy, who walks us through the legal basis for the decision, and we debate between us what we each think the impact of this decision will be on the bylaw-making power for New South Wales strata schemes. In particular, we answer questions about bylaws banning smoking, bylaws banning short-term letting, and bylaws that stipulate a dress code. For example, what you can and can't wear in the swimming pool. And that has been a topic here in the New South Wales media recently. Listen carefully for what Sharon and I have to say about those areas. Our view may be a little different to the views you've been hearing or reading elsewhere. You'll notice that I personally do not believe that this Cooper decision at all endangers our democratic rights in our apartment buildings or improperly restricts our bylaw making power. I believe this is an excellent decision from the highest court in our state of New South Wales and it is one that we have sorely needed for some time. I have welcomed it with open arms almost but not quite as much as Joe Cooper and Sharon Levy have. With that, let me take you straight on over to my very recent chat via Facebook Live with Joe Cooper and Sharon Levy. Hello and welcome, everybody. We are here on the Your Strata Property Facebook page and also heading out to LinkedIn. I am your host today, Amanda Farmer. I am the founder of Your Strata Property. We are often live on a Friday afternoon chatting about our week in Strata. 
And what a cracker of a week this one has been. On Monday this week, the New South Wales Court of Appeal handed down its decision in the case of Cooper and the owners of Strata Plan 58068. And since then, Everyone who knows a little bit of anything, something about strata in this state has been talking about this case, about the outcome in particular, which has been reported in some circles as a surprise outcome interesting, perhaps not as much of a surprise for some. In case you missed it, where have you been? Under a rock, busy, busy. If you've missed it or you just want a quick summary, The Court of Appeal, the highest court in New South Wales, in a unanimous decision, that is three judges, found that a bylaw preventing an owner or occupier of a strata lot from keeping an animal on their lot or the common property was invalid because it was considered to be harsh, unconscionable or oppressive. And under our New South Wales strata law, we cannot have bylaws that are harsh, unconscionable or oppressive. Now, I do have a link to the case for you so that you can read it. I suggest you go and check it out. It is at 102 paragraphs. It is not all that long for a decision of this importance. And it is fairly easy to read. Unlike some of our judgments, definitely check it out. It has a copy of, a full copy of the bylaw that was under challenge in this case. It's important that you have a look at it. You understand what that particular bylaw said for that particular building. It will be a bylaw that is familiar to many of you. Many of you will have just this bylaw in your own buildings. So have a look at it. I am seeing now, I'm just flicking back to my screen and seeing how many of you are here ready to learn more, ready to meet our special guests for today. I do have them waiting in the wings for you. And some of you are coming in and saying hi, which is awesome. I always like to see who is here joining me for our Friday live chat. I'm saying hi to Sean and Gary and Michael. It is great to see you here. If you want to drop me a hello, feel free, go on ahead in that comment section. I know some of you will be joining me from LinkedIn as well. I am very pleased to say that on Monday, it was actually Kathy Sherry who alerted me to the fact that this decision had been handed down. Kathy has chatted to us live on this page previously. She has been a podcast guest a number of times. She takes uh, a very clear view on pet bans and bylaws that unfairly regulate the keeping of animals in our strata schemes. And I've had a very happy note from her in my inbox. I was in uh, podcast interviews and member calls for most of the morning. And when I saw her note, I was just thrilled to hear about this success. A lot of the legal principles that Kathy has been talking about, that she's been writing about for such a long time when it comes to regulating what people do in their own homes when it has absolutely no impact on anyone else. Kathy has said for a long time that that is not legal and we needed some restraints on our bylaw making power. And we have that now with this Court of Appeal decision. Um, Kathy's book is also quoted in the judgment. So I think she was a little bit happy about that. Now today, we are talking about this case. We are talking about the legal principles. We're talking about the fallout, the outcomes. We are answering your questions about how this may apply in your building and to your building situation when it comes to your own bylaws about pets. And I am thrilled to be able to take you behind the scenes. I have two very special guests for you today. They are indeed Joe Cooper, our victorious lot owner, as well as Sharon Levy, the lawyer who led Joe's case to success. And I am bringing them on very, very soon. I have already told you that this is a cause close to my heart. I bought into a strata building a couple of years ago and I have a family. We have a little boy. He was about five years old when we bought in and he was intent that mom and dad, I would like a puppy. We're going to have a puppy. And we bought into this building. I looked at the bylaws, of course, as purchasers should always do. And I saw that there was a ban 
on pets. And my husband said to me, Amanda, not cool. We want to get a dog and there's a ban here. And at that time, these cases were just starting to come out of the tribunal saying that these bans were harsh, unconscionable or oppressive. We'd had the Yardi case, Little Baxter. Uh, that was our first case that said this ban is not legal. And these bylaws were starting to be questioned around the state. And I started to have this conversation with my committee, with the strata manager, when I first uh, took up ownership in the building. Great way to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm a strata lawyer and I'm about to challenge your pet ban because I want a dog. Uh, we had a meeting. I proposed what I drafted was a new bylaw changing what was the pet ban. And it was instead a bylaw that pets were allowed on application to the committee. The application could not be unreasonably refused. And if the application was approved, then these are all the conditions that apply to the keeping of the animal, very reasonable conditions. And I have to say at that point in time, I was lucky that I had the support of other owners at the general meeting. The ban was changed to an application process. That was a couple of years ago. Uh, soon after that, we got our little Louie. At the moment, we've got two or three dogs in our building. We're a 37 lot scheme. And over time, I think the first year we had about five dogs in the building. Tell you what, you wouldn't know they were there. My neighbours say that Louis is the most well-behaved resident in the block. So a cause close to my heart. I know what it is that you guys are going through, have gone through, what Joe has gone through, and part of the reason why I'm so pleased that we have this result this week. It is time to welcome in our first guest of today, and she is indeed Jo Cooper. Born and raised in Sydney and loving this town, Jo is a singer-songwriter. She gave up her job in the corporate world to follow her dream of singing. She says she always knew that she wanted to sing from a very young age, but her parents didn't agree to it being a real job. She writes her own songs and has nearly finished her very first album. She says she talks a lot and loves her coffee. As the world now knows, she also loves her very cute miniature schnauzer, Angus. Welcome in, Joe Cooper. Hey, Joe. How are you? I am doing very well. I've been going on and on about how happy I am this week. How happy are you, lady? I'm happy. I'm really happy. It's a, it's a surreal feeling. A lot of people have asked, you know, am I jumping out of my skin? I'm not. I'm exhausted, I think, first and foremost. So it hasn't really been, I haven't processed it very well yet. Yeah. It's been an intense, very intense week. I can only imagine. When did you, how you feel, when did you start this process? You know, I think we're talking years, aren't we? Yeah, uh, 2015, unfortunately. So it's just oh been God. over five years. If you remember, I, I contacted you very early on with a little little dispute and that was difficult. Everything's been really difficult. I don't think it should have been that way. I think Strata is a lot harder than what <laughs> it should be. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, too long time. Too long. Yeah. Too long. And where were you when you heard on Monday that you had won this case? What were you feeling? Walk us through it. Okay, so I was at um, my local cafe, La Teria. They have lived through this mm. with me. So, you know, you go to your local cafe and you're blah, 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 and they've seen the cries, they've seen the laughter. So I was there anticipating Sharon's call because I did say to her, look, I can't look up the judgment. You need to call me. And just a minute or two after 10, she called and she said, you won. And I cried hysterically to the point that strangers were concerned for me. <laughs> um, yeah, it was quite, I wasn't embarrassed at the time because I didn't really, I really thought I was in my own space, but I was on the street in a cafe. I felt relief. I know that much because I, it was a shock cry, but I didn't stop crying for hours I gave myself a migraine and, um, oh. yeah, it wasn't a good day. It, the outcome was great. I didn't feel great. Um, oh. It was just an outburst of emotions, I guess. Yeah, yeah, you'd been holding and carrying so much for so long. Yeah, so it mm. was intense. It was an intense, Monday was very intense. It's an odd feeling. I, I really struggled to articulate how I felt. But the crying was, yeah, many hours, many hours. Yeah. 
And what has happened since then? That was Monday. It is now Friday. You know, obviously you, you live in this building that has challenged you and brought actions against you. What's been happening at home? Um, how's this played out? Not good. It's still intense. I've I've been verbally abused in a few physical um, oh. encounters, unfortunately, throughout the few years. Since Monday, it's escalated. God. It's intense. So, I, yeah, I don't know how to describe it. It's it's not nice. It's more of the same but worse, obviously, okay. because of the decision on Monday. I'm trying to deal with that. So that hasn't made it easy either. Mm. I've yep. been flooded with media calls. That's <laughs> That's been intense also. And the best part is I have been inundated with messages and flowers and notes, you know, left at concierge of people telling me how I've changed their lives. So that's that's been emotional. Some stories are, are quite sad but then make me feel really happy that I took this on because although I knew it was really important, when you read some people's stories, you go, yeah, this really needs to be addressed. Yeah. And it has it has been such a roller coaster for you because you were successful at first instance. That yeah. was then overturned by the NCAT appeal panel. And then you then yeah. decided to take it forward to the Court of Appeal. All these ups and downs, what was it that kept driving you? Was it just this this sense of justice for other people? It was a mix of a few things. A lot of people see this as just a fight about a dog. Um, first of all, Angus, yes, he is a dog, but he's my family member. He, ironically, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have got through this because there were some days I would literally lie on the floor because I couldn't breathe. And he, you know, dogs, they, they know. So he would crawl on top of me and sit here oh. and just breathe with, with me. And, and, you know, that really made a difference. The second thing for me is I detest bullies more than you can imagine. I, I really detest bullies. And the reason I took it on is it wasn't a simple case of this building has a pet ban and I lodged a motion to change it and I failed. It wasn't as simple as that. I knew there was an anti-pet bylaw in place, but I also knew the operation of the building and I knew people with pets in the building. So I honestly thought it was an outdated bylaw and it was as simple as that. So when I did ask the question, I moved in without Angus, I left him with my sister because the thought process was, okay, I'll submit a motion for change. If I fail at that, not a problem. I've got the place that I want. Angus is a senior dog. We, you know, move somewhere else and, you know, wait it out. It didn't happen that way. I requested to submit a motion and my life has never been the same. I was told basically to leave the bylaw alone and the um, history of the horizon is you sneak your pet in and um, all is fine. That just didn't sit right with me because we have a lot of elderly in the building as well and one woman said something to me that really has stuck with me throughout the whole thing. She said, you know, I'm a widow. I've lost the love of my life. She met him later on in life. So she was only married for seven years. And she said, I don't qualify for an assistant or therapy pet, but Mm. I want a pet for company. I'm lonely and this bylaw enforces solitude on me. And I thought, yeah, this this is not good. So it's a mix mix of things. And mostly your your keen sense of justice, Jo. I have a huge sense of justice. I yeah, don't that that really drives me. Mm, I can see that. And there are so many comments coming in here. I just want to acknowledge some of them. You're getting lots of celebrating here, being told that you're a hero there from Amy. Kerry is saying, woohoo, Joe. I'm scrolling back down here. Uh, Francine, brilliant, Joe. Uh, Sean is saying the relief would have been so intense. I'm amazed you didn't pass out. I could just see you crying in the street and people saying, are you okay? And you say, I'm crying about my court judgment. I couldn't <laughs> even people think you're about to go off to them. Yeah, prison. I couldn't tell them. I actually couldn't. And for such a talker, I was really struggling to talk. But the boys that own the cafe, thank God, jumped in for me and sort of told people she's, she's that's actually happy tears because it didn't really look like. Oh, happy tears. amazing. <laughs> 
Yeah. Agnes saying, yes, family. That's who Angus is. Absolutely. Cool. And Roe detests bullies as well. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> nice one. Okay. Now, uh, how's Angus going? How is he sense? I mean, I understand how sensitive dogs are and they pick up on that emotion. How's he been this week? Well, he's sick of the photo shoots and the, the videos. He's like, I'm done. Um, do you want me to grab him? He's sitting right yeah, here. Yeah, please. Yeah, we'd love okay. to see him. The man of the moment. I keep calling Joe the, the woman of the week here, but we forget. There's a, oh, my hey. God. Hi. Isn't he so cute, everybody? Please. <laughs> tell you what. Look. Look, baby. You'd fight for him. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, and he's, he's little, isn't he? I haven't met him in IRL, but um, he's he's little. He's he's nine kilos. Oh, big enough! Look, say hi, everyone. Thank you for the support. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah, no, he's pretty. He's like, eh, I don't know what's going on. You humans are all crazy. That's his. I'll put him back down. <laughs> Lovely to see him. Thank you. Uh, now, there is a note here from Bill and Ben, and we're going to come back to this. I am bringing on very shortly uh, Sharon Levy, who is the lawyer who led your case to success, Joe, and we're going to have a chat to her about the legal issues. Uh, and yeah. Bill and Ben is noting that there is an option here for the owners' corporation to seek leave, special leave to appeal to the high court. So we will uh, speak to Sharon in more detail about that, just acknowledging you there, Bill and Ben. What's next for Joe Cooper? Are you, you have been so active in this space. You have been advocating for legislative reform. There is an amendment to our, um, of all things, sustainability bill here before yeah. Parliament at the moment, which would see a change to, specific change to our legislation about yeah. this. Are you continuing on in that space? Yeah. So I approached Ember a while ago when I found out about this bill, which I've been criticised quite heavily for because um, politicians are saying it doesn't belong in this bill. However, it just doesn't work that way. I've been watching and waiting for a bill to be put forward that has any connection with the um, strata legislation and this came up and yep. I took advantage of that. It's not, and it's there's not- a whole raft of things in that bill. Exactly. There, there are things yeah. in that bill about enforcing tribunal orders, which we've been jumping up and down about for a few I years know. now. Yeah, so that's, yeah. that's ridiculous. Yes, we are pushing forward with that. It was meant to be discussed this week. They've pushed it to next week. But, again, no guarantee. They keep pushing it mm. out. And we still have this petition that I really need to get the 20,000 signatures for. Uh, so I'm pushing with that. As you mentioned, the strata reform's in November and I believe it's getting pushed to December. I'm def- I've am i been invited to submit a, a submission and suggestions and I think to speak at, at some event. I am going to do that. I feel really strongly about this. I've lived in strata... I'd say for 20 years, Mm -hmm. I've never had an issue until I moved into the horizon, unfortunately. And the flaws in strata law are ridiculous. I'm not a lawyer, but corporation law, if I was to have gone through this ordeal in a corporate environment, there would be a huge investigation. But because this has happened in strata, people like me have no protection. There's nowhere to go. So, you know, Police won't help me. Politicians are like, oh, you, you know, you just deal with it. NCAT's sort of throwing the book at me and nobody's really listening. So mm-hmm. I think strata legislation needs to be ripped up and somebody who actually lives in strata and is a lawyer and has some common sense and compassion needs to rewrite it. Is that, stop looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm just scrolling back to Tracy's comment here because you mentioned the petition, Joe, and Tracy had asked, why do we need 20,000? Are you able to explain what happens when we get 20,000 signatures on the petition? Yeah, so the amendments already in Parliament, they're playing sort of silly buggers with with it. The petition, if we get 20,000, they have to discuss and debate it in Parliament. So this excuse of, oh, this amendment came in the middle of the night with no while no one was paying attention, you know, that just throws that out the window. And here you go, we've done the petition, you've got your 20,000 signatures, please debate it. And yourself and Sharon will touch on this later. But although the hardest part was the court, we still need the legislation to cement this decision so people aren't stuck with Strata saying, you know, oh, actually it doesn't apply to our building. We need to mm. make it 
clear in legislation and make it law. So yep. that's why the 20,000 signatures. Yep. And we will put a link to that petition in the comments here. That may come after we finish up today because I don't think I've prepped uh, and my, my helper in the background here with that link, but I will absolutely put that into our comments. So anyone who wants to sign up and support that change can do it and try and get that before Parliament. I'm just seeing uh, Francine is saying absolutely rewrite it and yeah. Agnes is saying, can I in any way help you on this journey? I think signing that petition, and I did see a note Agnes had said, I've already signed it, um, so <laughs> great to see all Thank of that you. support here for you. What would you say, Joe, to people who are in your position wanting to keep their family member in the face of a ban or wanting to move into an apartment with their furry friend? What would your advice be now? It's a tough one. I, I think it's a matter of personality. Um, if you don't have a stomach for um, controversial backlash, um, abuse, which I don't think anyone should have the stomach for that, to be honest. It can get very ugly. This has tested me like nothing else. It's a test. It, it breaks you. However, I would say if you feel strongly enough about it, make notes. So I have documented every day and that's the best advice I can give you. If you can find a property that fits the description and you don't have any challenges I mean that would be preferable yep but that's not easy in Sydney can I say I've had a lot of backlash on why would this woman move into a building that has no pet by law uh it took me 10 months to find a place and to be honest it's in Darlinghurst I did make the error of assuming it was pet friendly and I did admit that however like I said I knew there was pets in there so I thought yeah. it was just outdated check the bylaws although now I just don't believe a pet ban will fly. It's just been ruled that it's it's too it's too much. Don't go in there with a fight, definitely, because I didn't. I didn't come in here with a fight. But yeah, it, it really depends on personality. But if you feel like it's right, and that's what's driven me, I knew I was in the right. I, I knew it. I, I knew that I was honest from the beginning. And I was actually told to be dishonest. And that's the part that wasn't flying with me. Go with your gut. Go with your gut. Yeah. I like it. And I think, Joe, um, I smiled when you said, if you've got the stomach for it, because that is exactly what I tell my clients who yeah. come to me and say, Amanda, there's a ban and I have a pet. And, and certainly before this case, uh, there's a ban and I have a pet or I want to change it. And I say, look, this is a personal question. It's not a legal question. Uh, yeah. Do you have the stomach for this? Do you understand what's ahead of you? Uh, and I yeah. definitely think that path is much clearer now and easier because of all of your hard work, Joe. And we're going to get into that very soon now with uh with Sharon but there are just there are so many people here with so many grateful messages you'll have to come back and read through all of I those will. I will. um and Thanks I'm actually for sharing the link <laughs> here we go yes Kerry has shared thank you Kerry I should have put that shout out earlier that is the link to sign the petition thank you so much for that Kerry and yes and I can see Rochelle's put a link there as well awesome how many signatures do we currently have says Amy give me one second I shall tell you find out what I'm actually going to do, Joe has very kindly agreed um, to hang around in our virtual green room for a little while while I bring Sharon on. So we will have Joe back towards the end of our chat to do any uh, wrap up questions. And you can let us know that number, Joe, if you don't mind. 13,443. Okay, still a way to go, guys. Yeah. All righty. Thank you, Joe. I will have you uh, back on very soon and I hope Angus is there. Well behaved for you. you. I know it's this time of the day is dinner time for my doggies usually. Oh, no. He's got hours. <laughs> oh, good. All right. All right. Okay. We will see you in a bit. Thanks, Joe. Bye. A very happy Joe Cooper right there. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for all of your support there for Joe. We are now going to get into the nitty gritty, some hard legal issues here. You are getting today. Two for the price of one. Two New South Wales Strata lawyers here live for you. If you're coming in, you didn't see me earlier. I did say on a Friday afternoon when we're doing these live chats, we often call it happy hour and we do celebrate a little bit. So uh, I'm not sure that you can count on me all that much while I have a glass of champagne in my hands. It is that kind of week. I am welcoming in for us now, Sharon Levy. Sharon is a partner at Bartia Perry Lawyers in Sydney. Her expertise is strata 
and property disputes, as well as building and construction. She also has extensive experience in general commercial disputes. Through working in boutique and mid-tier firms for almost 20 years, Sharon has acted for a diverse range of clients, including owners' corporations and lot owners in both strata disputes and building defects claims. In addition, Sharon is the founding chair of a domestic violence shelter, a role which gives her valuable training, insight, experience into the duties and the obligations which govern many of her clients. She regularly appears in the District and Supreme Court as well as the New South Wales Civil and Administrative Tribunal. She prides herself on providing clients with exceptional results and an exceptional result she has achieved indeed for Joe Cooper. Welcome Sharon Levy. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Amanda. A pleasure to have you here with us today. What has your week looked like this week, Sharon? It's been manic, actually. It it, it was such a nerve-wracking weekend. Lawyers always want to do good for their clients, but this is this one held a special place in my heart. I'm a, I'm a dog lover and a cat lover, so this was a special one for me and certainly a career highlight. Yeah, absolutely. And just so people understand what happens um, when we're receiving a judgment is that we're often told by the court a few days before when the judgment is going to be handed down. And Sharon, you would have heard from the judge's uh, associate that the judgment will be delivered at 10 a.m. on Monday. Um, When did you hear that? Was that Friday and you had to sit through the the weekend? It was the Friday. So I was pleased it wasn't earlier, but it certainly was a long wait. And then on the, the Monday morning, because it was delivered online because of COVID. So Monday morning at 9.50, I'm on my my refresh button and on my email wondering whether it was going to come up on case law first or be delivered on my in my inbox. So um, yeah. that's why Joe received the call at 10.01 because I've been sitting here refreshing. Nice one. Now tell us, Sharon, why is this decision so significant for strata owners and residents in New South Wales? Amanda, this is a huge decision and, and in terms of where do I start? Certainly, it makes it clear that there's a limit on the power owners corporations have to govern apartment owners. It's clear now that the owners have a right to live in their apartment how they like, as long as it does not then adversely affect uh, the common property or other lot owners. It's also made it clear that in making the assessment on a bylaw and its validity and and determining whether it's harsh, unconscionable or oppressive, that it's an objective test. It's not a subjective test. So much was made about that in the NCAT appeal panel about the fact that Joe knew what she was buying into. She knew that it was a blanket ban. The Court of Appeal agreed with us that none of those factors should be taken into account because it's an objective test. Similarly, the Court of Appeal made it clear that it does not matter that it was voted on by a majority. It could have been voted on unanimously and it would not matter. Um, And that's because the bylaw binds other owners um, who had not yet purchased in to the building, um, so they didn't get a chance to vote. And it also, and probably less of a a big deal, but also um, it doesn't matter that a blanket ban would be more convenient to a strata committee. It doesn't make it any less oppressive. It just needs to be assessed as to whether it's harsh, unjust or unconscionable. Yep. So lots of lessons, lots of takeaways with this one. So much. I've read the judgment a few times now and I keep getting more and more out of it. I just want to address the point about democracy and the democratic process because it's the first thing that I hear and I'm sure you've been hearing, Sharon, and that Joe's been hearing and that's been in the media. What about democracy? What about the building's right to decide for its owners and for its community what it wants? Um, I had a meeting with a client of mine earlier this week who I know has a pet ban. And I said, uh, guys, just letting you know, as I'm letting all of my buildings know that this this decision has come out, this is what it means. And you may want to have a look at that pet ban at risk of there being a challenge. And of course, the first thing the committee said was, what about democracy? Uh, And what I love about this judgment is that the Court of Appeal said, a liberal democracy is not a majoritarian dictatorship. It's still, we still have these democratic principles, but there are legal constraints. And this is something that Kathy Sherry has been saying for a really long time. We still need to protect, and the law still does protect minorities from oppression. It doesn't mean it's undemocratic at all. We still have that process of going to a meeting and voting, but we have that protection built in for the minority. That's right, Amanda. And the Act has been designed with those protections in place. So the ability 
for an owner to make an application declaring a bylaw invalid to have it checked. So those that they're the checks and balances. So regardless of what the majority has voted on, there are still checks and balances in place. And that's not just the case with this strata legislation, but generally speaking, for example, in, in companies, there's such a thing, you know, there's oppression in mm. companies and voting and shareholders, and it's very similar. Yep. Now, the question that I have had a lot on this uh, Facebook page, particularly since I said you were coming on, Sharon, is this one. What does this decision mean for blanket bans? What is the status of a blanket ban now? A bylaw, for example, that might be identical to a bylaw that the horizon has. What's the status of those bylaws in other buildings? So, look, this decision will act as precedent. It binds everybody and certainly will bind the tribunal in any application, a similar application to what Joe made, for example, to have that bylaw declared invalid. So while it may be at this point in time still a valid bylaw, its days are limited, and if they were any lot owners were receiving a breach notice, for example, uh, for having a pet in contravention of their blanket ban, that lot owner has a very good defence. So if an application were to be made by the owners to NCAT with respect to that contravention or alternatively if the lot owner was to make an application to the tribunal to have the bylaw declared invalid, that tribunal is bound by the Court of Appeal decision. Mm. So the days of blanket bans are limited. Yep. And I do caution buildings out there who uh, hear that and say, well, the bylaw is still there and if anybody wants to come and bring their animal onto the lot in breach of the bylaw, we'll just prosecute them and we'll let all of that play out. Got to think about the, the costs involved in that, the emotional strain both on the committee and on the owners. I'm not sure that's the best option. And I do encourage buildings to have a chat to, if they have a, a lawyer who's helping them or find a strata lawyer who understands this stuff and think about what the best reasonable approach might be for your building now and planning that over the next 12 months to maybe do a review of the bylaws um, hand in hand with one of those people who knows their stuff. I think certainly the recommendation by any strata lawyer at the moment would be for anyone who has a blanket ban to do an urgent review and strongly suggest putting in place either one of the model bylaws or, or something similar with respect yeah. to, to pets. Yep, yeah, for sure. What about bylaws that may be a little bit different to a blanket ban? For example, a bylaw that says owners wanting to keep animals can apply to the committee and the committee has to consider that application, may not unreasonably refuse that application. That's quite common. Or And a bylaw that may have some limits already around animals. So only one dog or the dog has to be a particular size or a particular weight. What are your views on those bylaws now? While the decision only applies to blanket bans, it is still a very good guide as to how the court will now consider and apply that test to other pet and any other bylaw, in fact. Yep. So really, the question will be whether or not the prohibition or whatever is prohibited will adversely affect other lot owners and the common yep. property. So in terms of, for example, whether or not someone can have a fish in a tank. Under the Horizon bylaw, you actually could not have a fish in a tank, um, which was absurd. So if someone was to make an application to have a fish in a tank and that was refused, then arguably they've got a very strong position or application to take to the tribunal and have that overturned because it's been unreasonably withheld, that consent. So really it depends on the circumstances, but the question will now be whether or not that application or that prohibition is going to adversely affect other lot owners. So if someone yeah. wanted to have six dogs in their apartments, maybe that yes. noise or, or that disruption may adversely affect other lot owners. Um, if it's one or two cats, for example, it might be a different story. Yes. So what we're really getting at here is having in place a process where the committee, if that's the level at which these applications are decided, can exercise their discretion 
on a case by case basis. And I agree completely, Sharon, um, an application for six dogs and a bylaw that says that application must be considered and can't be unreasonably refused. If the committee was then to say, well, we are refusing that for these reasons, we think that the impact on other residents is going to be too significant, then that could well be a proper and valid decision. The the Court of Appeal talked about the administrative exercise, and I understand it perhaps was a submission from the other side, the administrative burden of having to exercise that discretion uh, is just too much for buildings and we shouldn't ask that of them. And the Court of Appeal basically said, bad luck. That's right. They rejected that argument outright. So that was one of the arguments put at the hearing, um, but it was rejected outright because it does not justify any administrative convenience by way of a ban, does not justify the subsequent oppression. And look, if you were to look through, for example, the model bylaws, there are examples after examples of circumstances where the committee is required to give that consent. So there's no reason to be just pulling out the pet bylaw and saying, oh, we need a blanket ban on this one, because all through the model bylaws, there are requirements for the committee to to consider positions um, and applications to do certain things. So there's no reason to separate pets from that decision-making process. Yep. Indeed. And the question that has been coming up in legal circles, Sharon, as you would have seen in people's blogs and what they're posting about and what our colleagues are talking about, is how does the reasoning in this judgment impact perhaps other bylaws that don't deal with pets? And I'm seeing some questions come in just in the comments here. I'm going to show Kay's question. I know there's quite a few more up there too, which we'll get to. For example, how does this affect a short-term let ban or a no smoking ban? Are those kinds of bans affected by this decision? Now, I'm happy for you there to jump in there if you like, Sharon. I've got some thoughts on that one too. Well, let's let's confer. My, my <laughs> initial thoughts are is that this judgment will absolutely apply to other bylaws. The court has made it clear that the test that has been applied is to the question of whether a bylaw is harsh, unconscionable or oppressive. It does not mean that that test is only confined to a blanket ban on pets. So, for example, the blanket smoking ban, I think it was. Arguably, if a lot owner can contain their smoke to their lot such that the smoke does not intrude or affect other quiet enjoyment of lot owners, then that's going to be okay. So, so yeah. a blanket ban on smoking within a lot, in my view, is now prohibited. Mm. Um, of course, that's different. A blanket ban on smoking on the balcony arguably the smoke will travel onto the other balcony. So fair enough, that's going to affect uh, adversely someone's quiet enjoyment of their lot. So that's okay. But I think a blanket ban on smoking within their lot only is now invalid or will Mm. be invalid if declared so by the tribunal. I think the key here, um, Kay and others who are asking this question and thinking about how this affects other bylaws, um, in my view, is constantly asking yourself, what job is my bylaw doing? What job does this bylaw do? How does it protect the enjoyment, and the Court of Appeal used the words, the material enjoyment of other lot owners' property rights? Is it regulating something that if it was allowed, for example, keeping the animal, if that activity was allowed, does it affect the material enjoyment of other lot owners' property rights. And the Court of Appeal has said, in the case of keeping pets, if that activity is allowed, it has no impact on other people's property rights. It's what you do in your own home. Smoking is an excellent example because I think the argument then becomes, does the smoke drift from somebody's internal apartment to the common property or other apartments and therefore affect the material enjoyment of another lot owner's property rights? If the answer is yes, then a bylaw can legally regulate that activity. If the answer is no, the smoke doesn't drift and it doesn't affect anybody else, then I agree the answer would be that's quite possibly a harsh, unconscionable or oppressive bylaw. So I keep coming back to what job is your bylaw doing Is it protecting other owners that may be affected by this activity? If no one's affected by the activity, why are we regulating it? That's the question. That's the question. And and I think to go alongside that, Amanda, it's a bylaw needs to benefit the lot owners. So if it is not benefiting the lot owners, so if the prohibition um, is making no difference, then it's fine. 
And short-term learning is another good example there that Kay has raised. I think absolutely we have quite a bit of evidence that activities from short-term letting have impact on other lot owners and the enjoyment of their properties uh, and the enjoyment of their property rights. And I'm quite comfortable that bylaws that regulate short-term letting are fine to the extent that they also comply with our New South Wales legislation. We do have Section 137A, which tells us what we can and can't do with our short-term letting bylaws. But I think short-term letting is a good example of regulating something that does affect the way people use and enjoy their lots and common property. Another example of a bylaw that perhaps doesn't do any work to protect other people's property rights uh, came up last week and I posted about this on the page and it was in the media. Did you see, Sharon, the lady who was swimming in her apartment building in Zetland in her bikini? and was told by a security guard that she needed to leave the pool because they had rules about what could be worn in the apartment pool and she was breaching those rules. That is in the back of my mind this week as we read this decision and talk about bylaws that regulate behaviour and things that may or may not adversely affect someone else's enjoyment. How do you think that fits in this week? Look, that is going to be a tough one because it's a matter of whether it's adversely affecting, as we've been saying, other people's enjoyment of the pool, for example. Mm. Um, It is not, though, the enjoyment of the particular lot owners of the strata scheme. It is the general community standard. So if the community standard was bikinis are fine, then arguably she's fine to be in there in her bikini. Potentially, if she was in the nude, swimming in the pool might be a different story because that's probably not as accepted in the community. But certainly I would have thought a bikini would be okay, notwithstanding, for example, if that particular strata scheme had an older population, it would not matter. So it's the community standard as opposed to strata standard. That is a very good point to remind us of that the Court of Appeal did take a different view there from the NCAT Appeal Panel and say that contemporary community standards of the wider community are indeed relevant. Whereas, And that was what the tribunal member at first instance said. And the Appeal Panel had said, no, the community standards are those of the strata building. So a really big difference of opinion there. Mm. And I think um, the Court of Appeal and the first instance decisions are correct in that regard because the ownership will change over time. So to that extent, um, a bylaw that was considered now compared to a bylaw considered in a year or two, if there's Mm. been quite a large turnover of of strata um, owners, would be different. So compare that though to comparing it to community standards, which is much more stable in terms of the fluctuations and the changes. Mm. Yep. The other question that's coming up, and it it came up earlier in these comments here, Sharon, I mentioned it with Joe, is what's the potential next avenue for the owners' corporation that hasn't been successful before the Court of Appeal? Is this over? Look, they have um, a right to make an application for special leave to the High Court. Um, I don't know yet whether that's what's going to happen. For the moment, I assume the owners' corporation are considering their position and we just need to wait and see as to whether this is the end for Angus and Joe or whether there'll be another fight on their hands shortly. Yeah, yeah. And indeed there is, as we were talking about with Joe, um, the opportunity and, in my view, the need for legislative intervention here to make very clear what it is that those who are are running our government intend for us to do and not do in our strata schemes when it comes to pets. And the fact that we have so much litigation about this, that people like Joe have had to spend so much money on arguing these points tells us there's something wrong with the way that our legislation is either drafted or the way that it's operating in the community, that it's not matching the way that we're actually living our lives. That's right. I think that's a good point. I think the legislation is a little bit clunky. It's difficult um, to interpret, which, as you say, is why we are um, seeing a lot of litigation in terms of the strata legislation. So hopefully the parliament can address that, particularly with Joe's efforts in terms of trying to make a change. Yep. 
Absolutely. Thank you so much, Sharon, for sharing those legal insights. We have lots and lots of questions coming into the comments here, and I'm going to go and scan through some of those um, in the last 10 minutes or so that we have. I am also going to bring back on our victorious uh, lady of the hour here, Jo Cooper. I think she's here waiting for us. I'll bring you in now, Jo. Hey, Jo. Thank you for waiting on there. I was was reading the comments, so it was okay. Nice one. I have uh, been grabbing them as I can. Uh, There's lots coming through thick and fast here. Jo, while we got you together here with Sharon, from your perspective, how was this experience of being before the Court of Appeal? Not too many strata owners uh, get there. Can you share with those listening who may be interested in what that's like, uh, how it was for you? It's nerve-wracking. You don't really know what to expect. I actually I actually said to Sharon, you know, if I'm forced to the, the Court of Appeal, Supreme Court, I would actually like to be in the Supreme Court. But because of COVID, we weren't in the court. We are in chambers. So yes. I think that made it a bit more comfortable, to be honest. So being in chambers and, and Sharon and, and um, the two Roberts, the barristers, made it as comfortable as possible. So the experience wasn't horrible. It was more nerve-wracking. But I, Robert Newlands, and Sharon would agree with this, as soon as he started talking, he just really delivered the argument so professionally. There was no hyperbole. It was really professionally, sensibly delivered, uh, and that put me at ease. So, yep. yeah. But overall, the it, you know, the idea of going to the Supreme Court is not a comfortable decision, no. Yeah. No. And it's not a place, uh, Joe. you've been successful and the way that it works in our system is that costs follow the event, as we say, at least when you're before the court, not the tribunal. So assuming that this is the end, then there is a cost order there in your favour, but you don't get it all back, do you? No. And we still got to fight for the um, the NCAT hearings, unfortunately, because um, I think you're aware that I got costs awarded against me six days after the court hearing. So that was a bit cheeky. So we still we still got a bit to do, unfortunately, and I'm still trying to put faith in in the system to do the right thing at the end of the day. Yeah. yeah. I just want to bring up here a comment from Phillies, and this is one that was raised earlier on the page um, that I want to make sure that we answer as best we can. Um, what happens in a building where they allow certain pets like cats and then state a certain type of pet is banned like a dog? Um, his owner's corporation has a blanket ban bylaw on dogs. Look, my view, and Sharon can weigh in on this, is that we've just heard from the Court of Appeal that, um, well, a blanket ban is harsh, unconscionable, or oppressive. I think you could extend that to a blanket ban on dogs. I know there's a further comment down about poisonous animals like snakes or crocodiles or a miniature horse, I think was mentioned, which has happened in in the US. Again, we come back to what's the impact? What's the impact on other owners and occupiers, use and enjoyment of common property. Poisonous animals, perhaps, risk of escape, perhaps there's an impact there. Dogs, as we've been talking about, the Court of Appeal has said uh, they don't see that there's any impact and so those kind of bylaws are invalid. Have you got a view on that, Sharon? I agree. No, I agree. I think the issue will be, so in terms of whether a bylaw is harsh, unconscionable or oppressive, Um, you take into account objective factors. The court has ruled that in terms of determining whether the strata committee would approve a particular application for a particular animal, then they would take into account subjective factors such as the size, the nature of the breed and that kind of thing. So subjective factors in terms of the particular application. And I think those things would be considered with respect to those examples that you've given. I suppose it's too early, Joe, to know or to hope if your building perhaps would consider a new bylaw that has an application process where people can apply for approval and these subjective factors can be taken into account on a case-by-case basis. We're definitely going to put it forward. Uh, A bunch of owners have already reached out and said, you know, we should be proactive in this space, uh, which hasn't worked for us in the past, but we're hoping to sort of try again. But, yeah, it it is too early. If you don't mind, can I address an issue that keeps coming up and I can see it in the comments and it really irritates me. It's a comment around allergies. It is a really annoying argument for me because it's been thrown at me and I've been called selfish and a home wrecker and all sorts of weird and wonderful names. There is no such thing as 100% 
pet-free building. There never will be. There will always be assistant and therapy pets allowed in buildings. So for the comment, I think it's Denise, if you are severely allergic to pets, I don't think Strata is the place for you. I have done the research and tried to find out through Sydney University if anybody has died from a pet allergy in apartments and they could not tell me of a case. This allergy argument, where does it stop? I'm allergic to dust. I take Clarentine or one of those hypoallergenic pills if I need to. People have allergies to peanuts. We're not going to ban our neighbours from having peanuts. Perfume is another one. Are we going to ban people from spraying perfume because somebody that's allergic to perfume will get into the lift? It is an absolutely flawed argument and people really need to stop using it as an excuse. A fear of pets, that's the other one. If you have a fear of pets, again, it's really confusing. Do you not walk the streets? I don't mean to be insensitive at all, but it's one that comes at me with aggression and it comes at a lot of people that are that have pets as family. People have to remember that a lot of us are allergic to an array of things. You cannot go and blanket ban. But as for I bought into this building knowing it is pet free, that's a lie. You cannot ban a therapy or an assistance pet ever. Mm. I just want to acknowledge there um, on this issue of allergies and thank you so much, Joe, for addressing that because we do have quite a bit of chat about that in the comments. Sarah, I've got her comment on the screen there. Uh, I think she is a supporter of your view, Joe, and she was asking for a rebuttal to be able to answer the same allegation that's being put against her in respect of allergies in her building. So thank you for asking those questions and for addressing that, Joe. When it comes to fear and allergies and exactly what you're talking about, Kathy Sherry's taught me a very good answer to that as well, which is if you live in inner Sydney and maybe you're in a semi-detached property or we're all living on top of each other as we like to do in these popular areas, you are going to be have the potential to be closer to an animal than you ever would be in a strata building where the cat exactly. is on level 14 and you're on level two, a cat that you will never see. And of course, we don't ban in freestanding if you want to differentiate them that way properties what people can do when it comes to the keeping of animals there yeah excellent all right now there are so many comments here that i'm (laughs) having trouble just flicking back and forth lots and lots of chat uh, questions and uh, comments here i am going to come back to those uh, and i welcome joe and sharon i'm mindful that it's friday night and maybe i'm the only one (laughs) who doesn't have anything very exciting to do tonight except go through the your strata property facebook page comments is there anything that either one of you would like to add before we wrap up here tonight i thank you so much for your time sharing this important information. Thanks, Amanda, for having us. I'm still flicking through these comments. There's a lot of allergy comments. Yeah. Um, I think it's important to note, Joe, as you said, the Horizons bylaw, even though it was a bank of ban on pets, as Joe says, the exception to that, even the Horizons bylaw was assistance animals. So even the Horizon who had a blanket ban on pets still had that exception. And I think yes. that's important to note. And they had to have that exception because it's the law. So even in the horizon, without Little Angus, there was no guarantee that someone would not get into a lift with a pooch. So I think that's important. Someone also raised the issue of peanuts. There's no law against a a child or an adult or anything eating a peanut in a lift in the common property, dropping it on the floor, dropping it in the lift. Um, So I think in terms of the allergy argument, Joe's put it very well. Thank you, Sharon. Yeah, I've, I've been regurgitating it for five years. So, yeah. <laughs> and look, even we we heard it a lot. That that argument, as your lawyer, Joe, that was one argument that I got a lot. But yeah. also, but she knew about it. That was yeah. the other one. So I was so pleased when the court, in its judgment, spent so much time making clear that Joe's knowledge did not matter because the bylaw binds everybody it binds subsequent owners it does not matter what you're buying into and it does not change the the fact that whether a bylaw is harsh unconscionable or oppressive needs to be measured against the objective standard as opposed to anything to do with joe or anything to do with angus and we should still have a right to challenge things without being abused for it we have that right It, it is a legal right to challenge things i believe Yes, and, no, and nobody should suffer bullying and abuse, full stop. No. For whatever reason. For whatever reason, yeah. 
Thank you so much for joining me, Sharon Levy, Joe Cooper, and everybody, so many of you here today. Uh, I wish you all a happy, safe weekend in your homes, uh, with or without your furry (laughs) friends, as it may be. And I hope Angus has some special treats for the weekend, Joe. He does. He does. He's very well looked after. Don't worry. He is indeed. (laughs) I want to say a huge thank you to Sharon. She has been amazing through this and my stress levels were through the roof. Um, (laughs) Through the roof. Um, You were were just above and beyond. You you dealt with a lot with me, so thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I I must say when Jo started crying when I gave her the news on Monday, it made me tear up. So it was very emotional, I think, for both of us just because I knew how much it meant to her and certainly this was one that I just wanted to get across the line and would absolutely a career highlight for me, Jo, and and one that I will remember. So thank you for asking us to be on your legal team for the Court of Appeal. Thank you for doing a brilliant job. And so many of us were so happy to receive that judgment and, you know, not as personally and invested as both of you, but I know for sure when I read that, I actually ran out and I had both my husband and son were here (laughs) at the time and I said, we won, we won. (laughs) I'm not on the team, guys. I'm not on the team. (laughs) It is a we. It is a we. It impacts a lot of people. So, So yeah. 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 So thank you. Go and enjoy your weekend. Go buy some more tissues. (laughs) I will. Thanks Thanks. so much, ladies. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you for listening to Your Strata Property, the podcast which consistently delivers to property owners reliable and accurate information about their strata property. You can access all the information below this episode via the show notes at www.yourstrataproperty.com.au. You can also ask questions in the comments section, which Amanda will answer in her upcoming episodes. How can Amanda help you today?